Welcome to the Wednesday live stream. No, it's not Sunday. We've moved them to Wednesdays. So if you're listening to this on the podcast, you're listening after the fact, that's fine. But if you want to come visit live, Wednesdays. Where my dogs will be barking, the birds are singing, the frogs are chirping. All right. <clears throat> so today, I'm going to try something a little different. I'm going to start giving or mixing in some of my presentations I do at clubs and events and things like that because I haven't been speaking as much lately. And there's kind of some of them I've retired and I haven't updated them. And it's been pretty fun to actually open it up and go, oh my gosh, I forgot the store looked like that or my fish room used to look like that. And uh, even if I've given, I've, I was kind of looking up the talk I'm going to give today. And even though I gave this talk probably eight years ago, maybe more, I've learned since then, and new products exist. Like one slide shows, here's what I use. And then I was like, oh, I literally invented my own version of all of these products. And so, um, yeah, we'll get into it. There'll be a Q&A afterwards, and I'll see how long these are going to take. Um, normally, they're scheduled for about a 50-minute thing if you ever go to a club, usually it's 50 minutes to an hour, maybe 45 minutes to an hour presentation, and then uh, some Q&A afterwards. I try to run a lot of Q&A, and depending on how many stories I weave in, this thing could be two hours or 30 minutes. So I'll be watching the uh, the chat as I go, and just like in a real life scenario, someone will raise their hand, I'll ask the question, because it'll be relevant to the slide that I'll be presenting, and we'll keep it on topic. So this one won't be so much just random Q&A. It's going to be about the topic, which today is mini ponds outside. You may notice some are tubbing, um, but I think mini ponds is more applicable. And that could be as small as a bird feeder to, you know, maybe a thousand gallons, whatever you want to make of it. But I uh, learned a lot. So, all right. Oh, what do we got? We got... Something wrong with the mic? Maybe I can fix it. What are we... Hmm, I'm looking to see what's wrong with it. Because I won't do any whole presentation if there's something wrong with the mic. Yep, I think it's a new mic. I'm sure he'll work on it next time. But I don't know what's wrong with the mic. Can't find it fast enough. Hmm. It looks to be working. And I hear it. Yeah. All right. No one's saying anything about the mic, so I am... Oh, it's a reverbing. Mm. Let me see if I can monitor it real quick. Let's see here. And... Testing. Oh, it's not... It's not even... I have to play my audio back. Well, that's not useful. Bit of an echo. I don't know if I'll be able to fix that today, but <clears throat> that is super annoying. I'm trying to think of how I could fix that quickly. Maybe it's too loud? Maybe, but mm, we're going to go with it. Let me get this presentation lined up and uh, let's see. Could be far away, could be, could be too close. I mean, the microphone sits here and it moves about once every six years. So chances are pretty good. Maybe it's the excess noise from outside. Uh, I'll dial it in. That's what I get for changing things. Very change things. Makes life harder. All right. We're gonna swap the software. To the picture show. All right, this is a, a shot of the store. Very young shot. You can see there's kind of nothing. Can I get a can I get a pointer? Is that a thing I can get? Mm, I don't know. All right. Oh, you can see. Okay. So there's no merchandise or anything up here, and there's nothing even on the sides of the wall. So very early stage shot of the retail store, but enjoy nature daily, and that is. The theme of mini outdoor ponds, they bring your family together, even the people that don't even like fish, 
because there's so many more things that end up in your water. It might be birds and bees and newts and salamanders and snakes and, and all of that. Neighbor kids. And so you can draw the whole family in and this is the gateway drug to aquarium keeping. So this is me in like, well, it's not like in 2012. We went on this uh, collection trip, ALA convention, out in the water as I always do. I get way out there and flirt with all the, you know, crocs or uh, caiman or whatever's going to be around. And so I learn a lot about what's living in those waters. And in this one uh, here in Florida, this first time I ever collected, I was keeping fish outside and everything already. But this kind of brought in some more, when you're trying to catch fish out in the wild, you see where they congregate and what they're doing. And then that you can apply that to um, your own little mini ponds. So, and, you know, bring in, here's the wife. Wife uh, is even getting in on it. So we were collecting. And, and here in this trip, we caught Florida gar. We caught mollies. We caught all kinds of stuff. And, uh, you know, so predator fish, little nano fish, all those things. Now, here I am pulling up. A big thing of water hyacinth. You guys have seen these for sale, probably at your local fish stores and at pond supply stores and everything like that. And inside here, there's fish, there's bugs, there's on the tops of the plants spiders, all kinds of stuff. And as you start digging through, like what what is in these ecosystems? That's where you go. Okay, there's going to be a lot of predators, right? So one of the first things they you know they tell you is the most dangerous thing when you're collecting is actually heat exhaustion or heat stroke and fire ants. So being up on the up on you know the bank, you're actually at a worse, you're more likely to have something bad happen there than you are in the water. Because in the water you're cooling off. Yeah, you might get eaten by a crocodile, but you might get stung, um, you know, stung so much from. So you start digging through and they say the one thing that kind of really hurts in the water that's not a crocodile or anything like that are these, these things, these water scorpions. So I don't know if those ever actually stung me. Every once in a while something gets you and you're ah, what was that? Ow. But I wasn't going to test and be like, was it the water scorpion? And they'd be like, oh my gosh, it's horrible. And so luckily I never got stung by one, but these little predators in there are in the water. Then we had crayfish. So this is all coming out of what we're, you know, this one scoop. So then you got crayfish. Oh, and then you got newts. Same thing, right? This is all from one scoop of life out of a, you know, the canal basically. And fish, it's like a little, I think it was a little warm mouth or something, whatever they called it, right? So a little baby fish. Living with all these things. Got a molly, right? Not bad. And so fish have to live with predators. There's also birds. There's all the stuff. They also have to live parasites and all of this. And so when you're, you're going to experience all of these things in your little mini ecosystem you build outside. And so when, when you build this thing, you're now ready for what's coming, but don't necessarily fight it off. The fish are kind of used to it. I recommend you embrace a lot of those things because they're they're very fascinating. But um, let me turn this down just a hair. Maybe that'll help. Let's see if that helps. Embrace the nature. That's that's the biggest thing. Enjoy it daily. I've I've watched cats eat my fish. I've watched raccoons eat my fish. I've watched neighbors' kids terrorize my fish. And I've watched squirrels get in there. I've watched birds. Like my big koi pond, bald eagles and everything ate all my koi. So, you know, you, you got to learn to play around. All right. So this, I want to talk about maybe what's going to happen or why you might want an outdoor pond. So besides the, I want to breed fish. They're super cool. I'm a nerd. I'm all about this. It's actually very good for your local environment. So this was near uh, a place I would hang out. It's actually near the, the shop of the person that helped me build my store originally. 
And this water would dry up about maybe July. And then water wouldn't really come back for a couple of months. And what we knew <clears throat> is this drainage ditch here, that's what this is, a drainage ditch, would be the water source for so many animals and so many other things. And so as it gets dry and it gets cracked up, everything's forced to retreat. Got to go find water. You know, it's like you're watching, you know, some like National Geographic thing where it's like, and then the seasons change and the water goes away and the, the, the caribou are forced to go find water and then the lions jump them and that's what everything has to do. So the next slide you'll see, this is all the frogs, they retreated. This is in a, a drainage grate in this parking lot basically. And so all the motor oil, everything goes in there and these guys probably aren't gonna make it. Sure, could I have scooped them all out? I could have. And then they would have hopped and not found water again. That's unfortunate, right? Now, why? Why are you talking about all this nature, Corey? One, because I think it's very important. But two, I'm going somewhere with this story. Because we tell the story all the way through using this example. Because this is an example just like it might be at your house, right? So then we go to the back of this building, this parking lot, this thing that has no water. And we've got this. So this person, Andy, good friend of mine, is actually a beekeeper. So he's got lots of bee hives and stuff around. And then we've got this 700 gallon tote that I tracked down. Why? Because we were gonna breed fish outdoors and sell them at the retail store and get rich. Well, that doesn't usually work pan out that well, but we had a lot of fun. And so in this setup here, we can see that this actually is a big filter. We turn this 100 gallon tank, stock tank, into a filter, and we learned a lot of things. We also put these windows. You might be able to pick up some free windows or something like that. I think maybe the skylights actually off of Craigslist for 20 bucks or free or whatever, right? You can see in the background, we've got some more windows. You can see we've got a shower side door because that goes right here when you're not feeding trying to keep predators out we're also trying to keep it warmer during this the winter so if you can find something to put over the top during the winter you get the solar heating the sun's beating down on it you trap it in there because the wind doesn't want to just carry the the heat away and you'll get the thermal effect going which is really good if you want to extend your season so, what are the benefits of this pond besides just, you know, making your first $7 billion breeding fish, right? Well, you're going to help local wildlife. And that's what I think actually is the biggest benefit. So here, you, you know, you see this is just a little section of the pond. Not a big, you know, maybe three feet wide. And if you really start looking, you can start seeing things like, hey, wait. Isn't that a snail on top? Yes, it is. Isn't this just a random pond lily that you probably bought for like $7 at Home Depot? Yep, it is. And then you go, wait, isn't that a frog? Weren't those frogs like dying? You're right. Some of them found their way here to push forward. Now, with all of these, you know, these lilies, they're actually the best place for bees to go and drink and other little insects. They land on the little lily pads, they get their drinks, they swim off. Some of them are going to lay larva and stuff like that in the pond. That becomes fish food, frog food, all those kinds of things, right? Here's a little close up. You can see it right here. Nature. Predator and non-predator. You got water, you got the lily pads. So you got this frog. Oh, maybe that frog, if it gets bigger, will eat this fly. But for today, they're friends. They both need water. You see this in National Geographic stuff all the time. The predator and the prey, but they're all huddled around a puddle because they're like, we're both going to die to no water. So nature kind of knows, like, all right, truce, we got to get a drink. And uh, yeah, so, and don't forget, there's always some duckweed. Duckweed's always good.
going to infiltrate your bonds. But life finds a way, right? And those tadpoles, some of them did not retreat to the drain. They retreated to this pond. They found, you know, the adult frogs laid in there. And there's even tadpoles. So we've got some floating plants here. These are water lettuce. Easy to find. Usually you find them in an aquarium. They get much bigger outside with a lot of sun, a lot of nutrients. Got all the duckweeds. And then also in the same pond, you can see here, here's really red cherry shrimp. Not a great picture of it because I wasn't trying to get that picture really that day. Um, I was actually trying to get a picture of all the root hairs. So sometimes you'll hear me talk about when we're talking about aquarium plants, root hairs. These big, long stalks, people normally like those are the roots. Yes. But what actually feeds on the nutrients is all the little hairs that come out. And so that's why when you plant a plant inside of sand, they can't really, uh, you know, can't really fan out their little root hairs. They don't feed as well. So I was actually taking a picture for root hairs for a different project, but I caught that this cherry shrimp was there. And, and know this, sunlight is kind of amazing. You'll get the best colors out of your fish or shrimp or anything you've ever seen, way better than an aquarium, when it's outside. Part of it might be all the pollen and all the things that fall in your pond, but then also just a lot of, a lot of sunlight. So then... This is another type, you know, if we go back here real quick and you look at, hey, that can't be in the front of my yard. Maybe it's got to be in the back of an industrial building. I get it, right? Not everyone's doing doing this. But maybe you want to experience nature and you, this is a client of mine. I used to service their aquarium. And they put in this giant, like, bubbling waterfall brook thing that kind of went through their property and you would see insane amounts of birds laying on here, getting a drink. You'd see all the dragonflies. You'd see all the nature. They said they had lots of deer coming, all of those things coming to get a drink. Now, they didn't do any fish outside, but they did. You know, I was breeding some fish and stuff. And this is actually the client where I fell in love with uh, Variatus platys. Breeding there, great. And uh, But this might be something where you're going, okay, I have children. I can't have a pond. I'm afraid they could fall in. I didn't need it to look good. You could have something that there's very little standing water, actually, but you get the sounds and you get all the nature from it. So that's just another look at it. Now, there's still more ways to do this. What if you want to become, uh, you know, extra nerdy? You go to this. This is Carl Trochu of Miami Swordtails. So he's given a talk for us in the past. Uh, on if you're a member, you've seen that talk. This is his actual fish room, and I've been lucky enough to visit a few times, and it's super cool. He also, you can see a bunch of you know, sword tails and stuff up here. These are really nice sword tails. Uh, but again, he gets water changes from rain, he gets the bugs, he gets everything, right? Here's another shot of that, that setup. Now, not, you know, mini ponds or whatever, call them whatever you want, this is just one more style. This is in, you know, Florida. And then you've got, well, what did Corey do? This is two houses ago, at least. Uh, right when we first opened the store, because that's kind of when I made this presentation. So you see, I've got a couple, well, maybe you don't see it, but let me see if I can move myself. There we go. Got a couple of uh, little 10 gallon tanks down here. Wait, see if it'll, yeah. This is where I was breeding a little bit of Daphnia and some other stuff. And then I had all of these ponds. These are, this is like a 120 gallon pond that I bought. And then these were Rubbermaid ponds. You see, I have four of them. I really like the Rubbermaid ponds. They're fairly cheap. They're rigid. They hold up. They're already drilled for a, uh, a bulkhead. And I'll show you what I do with those later when we talk about filtration and stocking and all of those types of things. Um, and then I had a big Laguna 360 gallon pond. And honestly, I kind of like the 100 gallon ponds. They're kind of a sweet spot of, you can do quite a bit. They're still movable if you need to bring them indoors so it gets too cold. They're, they're just nice and rigid. So those are ended up being my favorite, so. And then you've got some that are more natural. Like this is more of like a half whiskey barrel. This was actually in the yard of the beekeeper at his personal residence. And these are all the ferns that grow natively and this was to basically let his bees drink and other wildlife to come get a drink, right? 
So that you can get to be real natural if you wanted to really, um, you know, hide it on your property or really blend it in naturally and not have just, you know, like I did, totes on this, the backside of your garage. Now, this time I went pond crazy because I actually couldn't, my fishery was only six tanks because I didn't have, I had a small office and I was running the store and I didn't really have room. And then I have one more example, well, a couple more examples. This was a 75 gallon tank. I put on some blocks outside of a different garage, the home before that one I just showed you actually. And then you see here, the little wash bucket type tote. And here I was actually breeding Mary Widow's live bearers. And uh, I've got some water lettuce over here. I've got some floating water Sprite. I've got baby tears growing like gangbusters, right? And I might, I don't know if I have pictures of this later, but I definitely had lots of predators here. And these were my neighbor kids, actually. They were um, great kids, but they got interested in the fish once I had them going. And uh, they like to feed the fish, but I, I didn't keep fish food outside. And so they actually fed one time, it was a turkey leg, you know, like or a chicken leg went in. Another time was a, a turkey sandwich. So sometimes I'd come home from working at the store. Well, actually this time I was working at the previous Conway Tropical Fish. I'd come home, you'd mostly be green water, but then you'd see like, what is that? Or you'd be netting fish and going, is, that's a bone. And so they wanted to help, and they were interested, but, uh, you know, you could you can get uh, some problems going on if people are throwing half a turkey sandwich in there. So realize you're going to attract everything, not just wildlife, wild neighbors too. Everyone, what you doing over there? You know, I saw a cat doing a thing over there, and it's just, you know, that water source just starts sucking people in. So put myself back in the corner, back in the corner where I belong. Yeah. All right. Another little bird bathy, you know, nature kind of going on, wild garden. This is also my beekeeper, which uh, learned lots about bees from, from this gentleman. And we actually even tested feeding bee pollen and bee grubs and mixing into rapashi. And it actually, you can actually do some crazy cool things with fish foods and in, in that. But, uh, you know, another little way, just like, even if you, you don't even want to manage a pond, getting a little bird feeder will accomplish a lot of the things that we're talking about here. Nice little patio install. And I, I feel like it's important to show you all these different types so you can kind of fit in and go, hey, I'm, I'm kind of trying to go for something like that, or I'm going to set up 12 ponds behind my garage because I'm Corey, or I need to be presentable because I do, you know, barbecues and picnics all the time, and my wife would kill me or my husband would kill me. Maybe you gotta, you know, work something like this in where it's got a lot of nice plants. You know, they've got a, a nice yard here. And I just thought, you know, it's a pretty good setup if you really wanna make something more permanent. And we can talk about the bricks and how they help insulate and, and things like that as we go. So what are the basics you need besides a container? You need something, 10 gallon aquarium, a wash tub, a pond, a Rubbermaid tote, something. After that, I find that all you kind of need are what's here, which oddly enough, we've actually made our own versions of almost all of this stuff. So I, I, I think you need an air pump. I think you need a sponge filter and I'll, I'll explain why. You need fertilizer. I really like to get the water to go green or get the plants really going well, because when you first set it up, you just hold your hose, you fill it full of water, nothing's really growing, right? And you're gonna need something to take chlorine or chloramine out of the water. So the way I like to start my ponds, I actually like to get them started now. That's why I'm giving a talk right now. You might be going, well, it's like almost snow and it's a little bit cold. We're a little ahead of, you know, we're ahead of the game. Not really. You kind of want to be setting it up now, filling it with water, getting the sponge filter going, getting the algae growing, putting the fertilizer in, getting pollen to fall in, getting leaves to fall in, getting things to happen. So that way, when it does warm up, maybe it's April, maybe it's June. A lot of times we have to wait till June here. Sometimes we can sneak it in April, but sometimes in April it snows. So I like to have a nice cycle pond ready to go ahead of time with lots of gunk because I'm going to make lots of babies in there and not wait to, oh, it's already hot. I should have started a while ago. So start early. Gives you time to order your crap from us or go look at local fish stores or whatever it's going to be. 
and slowly put it together, you know, convince someone like your kids or your husband or your wife to dig a hole. Maybe you can recess it down a little bit even. Brown's frozen, that's not going to work, but, you know, give you time. That's the, the key part. I like to get it going early. You could take a sponge filter to be cycling in your aquarium to put outside. There's all kinds of stuff you can do. But I want to I wanna learn how it's going. And I want to optimize, too. Because this hobby, each year you do it, it'll get better. And then each month you're doing it, it's getting a little better. Like, towards the end, and I'll show you those pictures on some of them, I was actually running the air pumps inside my fish room and running the air line outside. So I was pumping hot air in there. And then I was working on ways to trap that hot air, right? And the solar energy... Because in the Pacific Northwest, we might only get three to four months. But if you employ some tactics, now you're going six, seven months. You're like, hey, that's most of the year, honestly. Right? Another way you can filter it, if you really, really want to go with a pump, which I don't. But if you did, I like the bucket filters I make. Um, we have a video on how to make these, by the way. Put out a long time ago. It was like our first hit video, I think, really. And you basically have a pump sitting down in the water, and it pumps water up, and it's going to trickle. This is a dollar store uh, bowl that I drilled a bunch of holes in to make it in a new colander. And you can put like a little fine white pad up here. That's usually what I did. And then, But you want to drill these big holes up above so that if your white pad got full of fish poop, it would still go in the bucket and not just drain your pond and everybody be sad, right? Let me see. And then you can see another picture here. From there, the water goes down. This is a piece of cycled sponge I had and then a bunch of bio rings. Now, what you don't realize yet is that you're going to suck up all the babies, the baby shrimp, the baby, you know, maybe white clouds, whatever fish you're trying to breed or whatever you're trying to do, it's going to get sucked up into there and it's gonna die. I've tried it so many times. I've watched people that are really good at what they do and they try and do this and they go, oh, I didn't realize the pump. They don't realize it till the summer's over. I didn't make any babies. Oh no, the pump, even with sponges on it, that kind of stuff, these fry, especially from egg scatters and stuff that people really like to try outside are so fine that they just get sucked up and you don't get the yield that you wish you could have by the end of the summer. You know, maybe, you want 500 uh, cherry bars at the end of summer, well, you might end up with two instead of 500. So I, I'm going to show you other methods. The sponge filter I really like, and there's ways you can, can optimize that. I see someone said, where's Candy? Candy, uh, being that it's Wednesday, she's actually in a meeting at the moment. So she might join after the meeting? Not sure. Next up, this setup, this is what I used at the store. These are 100 gallon Rubbermaid totes again. Okay, we're on board. And then I'm showing you this. This apparatus is my own design and I'm quite proud of it because it came after daily use and over time making it better and better and better. Now, just because in my own brain I invented this, I'm sure there's 20 other Bizarro World quarries out there that have done the exact same thing. So I'm not saying like, no one's ever done this before. I'm just saying I never saw anybody do it before, and I think I'm a genius in my own little fish store figuring it out. So what is, what, what's so special? What is Corey talking about? It's this right here. This intake sponge. Hey, you guys sell those. At the time, this wasn't our brand. We made ours better. It was more coarse. It was made for pond pumps. But it was too coarse, and they were too expensive, and you were really hard to find. But we made this. Now, what is this? This is an uplift tube. This is a sponge. If I didn't have this other outlet, this is basically a sponge filter, right? Now, what does the other open part do? That's what you want to know, right? I wanted to make, I ran a lot, you know, probably six or seven of these ponds at the store, and they were on wheels, and we housed koi in them, and we had to catch fish out to sell them, but we had to change a lot of water because we might have keep 200 koi or 100 koi in here. And we needed to make sure they didn't get sucked up. We needed to make sure that we had some biological, and we needed to put air in there, right? So the other end, right here, you put a bulkhead, which they're already drilled. That's why I like these Rubbermaids. 
They're already drilled. You one inch bulkhead right there, you put a valve, you now can drain. If we go back to this slide, the water comes through the sponge and goes out. You just go water change time, boom, water slown out. Now, versions I've done in the future, we actually hook up a hose to this. So you flip this, now I go water the garden, right? Middle of summer, hot, you gotta be watering your plants anyway because you're hanging outside, right? That's what's going on here. You could be doing that. Now, it's also your filter. So remember, this part over here, that's where the water goes out. Water in, water out. But what happens when you close this valve? When we close that up, water doesn't go out. Well, how's it gonna work? You put your airline tubing down the tube, just like a sponge filter. Now you've got air going up, water and air, or water getting sucked into that sponge and going up. So you've turned this, it's a sponge filter. Airline tube goes down to the bottom, air rises up, water gets sucked through. Dual purpose, made it crazy easy. And then we just sat the air pump on top of the grating, which this grating keeps us from jumping, keeps hands out, keeps raccoons out, keeps cats out. So you can buy this wire shelving that you put in a closet from your Home Depot or Lowe's or hardware store, right? So that's just kind of one little uh, genius little way that I liked to make it easy to water change. And I, you know, we had to put them on wheels. You don't need to put them on wheels unless, unless it gets super cold. Someone's asking me, what do you do when it gets tw minus 20 degrees? Well, you roll this bad boy into your garage, right? You have it out all summer, you roll it in the garage, overwinter them inside, and then you roll them back out when it's good again. So, you know, maybe these are just like Harbor Freight wheels. I think they're like 20 bucks a piece. It's a little bit of a pain to build, but you've got, it's gonna be able to hold like a thousand gallons or a thousand uh, pounds to do a hundred gallons of water and all the stuff you do. So, uh, and you don't want too small wheels, otherwise you just, get stuck on a tiny pebble. So bigger wheels, easier to move. All right, let's talk about some different fish you could keep outside, right? So that's always like, people ask, can I do this? Have you done this? What would you do? Those types of things. Some fish work well in some climates, some work better in others. If you're living in Florida, you can do almost anything. If you're living in Alaska, ooh, it's gonna get real cold, right? So very ass platies, I've done those outside, made a lot of them. They, for me, they went as cold as about 65 degrees, much under that, they started to get sick and, and those type of things. And what I do, or what I was doing for many years is I would make a bunch of fish. So let's say I've got a hundred of these platies now by the end of the summer, I would intentionally always leave like 10 to 12 in the pond. Sometimes you're just gonna miss them. They're hard to catch them while you got plants in there, all that. You leave some in. And each week I would still test the water, you know, temperature and everything to see like, are they doing okay? Are they thriving? And every once in a while, so maybe you go like another three weeks and the water temp is 52. I might take six of the 12 that are there and bring them inside and know that these ones go colder better. Next year, these will be my breeders. And you can each year make a strain that's going to be better at being outdoors in your climate, in your water. So you know which ones to keep, which ones to sell. All right, we've got rice fish, which is kind of hilarious to me. These rice fish, the Madaka rice fish, I was doing this presentation before I'd ever went to Japan and discovered all the fancy rice fish which if you look in some of my first videos, you're like, I've never seen these before. And, and I don't think many people in the US had ever seen them because I was blown away. Uh, but yes, rice fish, especially all the colorful ones. now. Great candidate to be putting outside. I've done rainbow fish. What I like about rainbow fish outside, they love to eat bugs. So that's, that's a plus. And then also the green water that you get going raises their fry really well. You also can uh, easily have multiple ponds, put in spotting mops or water hyacinth or uh, any of the floating plants get big roots, frog bit, there's a lot. You can move those to a pond with nothing in it. 
all the eggs hatch out that they lay on there, and uh, you're off to the races. You can do bedas. Bedas can be done outside. I know I knew a breeder that would always in the summer put male and females together, and he would raise you know probably 500 bedas and supply all the local stores. They love eating mosquito larvae. They love eating everything. And so, again, easy to breed outside. Killifish, another decent one. Swordtails. Some of the swordtails can go fairly cold, just like the variatus. Killies like to be a little cooler, right? Now, if you're in a really hot climate, maybe you're like, oh, I'm in Arizona. It gets way too hot. Maybe you start bringing in apistos, right? There's also some apistos, apistogram borelli, that goes much cooler, there's reports of people breeding Epistogramma borelli outside year-round in California, right? So options. You're going to have to test some stuff. You won't always be successful, but I recommend starting when it's warm. Wait till your tanks are like, oh, it's hitting 70, 72 in the, you know, in the, the daytime and drop into like that 68 at nighttime. It takes a while to get there. That's why we set it up early. We just wait. Patience is hard. Obviously, koi are an option for a pond outside. Same with goldfish, even fancy goldfish, right? We've got neocardina shrimp, cherry shrimp, yellow shrimp, blue velvets, all that kind of stuff. What's cool about them is I've overwintered them, and I'll show you that picture later uh, in the Pacific Northwest, where we only get down to like the teens normally. But it had two inches of ice across the whole top of the pond. Shrimp still shrimping. You know, you like... You, clear out the snow and you look in and the shrimp are just like, is it summer yet? No. Okay. I'm going to stay in here still. Um, endlers right here. Great fish go much cooler than guppies. Now I've done tons of guppies outside, but they don't do as well in my opinion, uh, at the colder end. So at the beginning of the season and the long or the, the end of the season, I wouldn't, I'd bring them in early, put them out late, bring them in early, type, that type of thing. Someone says, here in California, you can get free mosquito fish. Yep, that's true. They want to control the mosquito population. Some other koi here. This is, uh, so we've got butterfly koi up here, and then we've got uh, some kohakus and, and platinum koi here. Down here is a fish I actually have my fish in right now. This is the gold Heterander formosa, the least killy fish, which is actually a live bearer. Comes out of Florida, easy to keep. Nano fish, that's what's important. You could have a hundred of these things and put them in a 20 gallon and it would look appropriate. So you don't have to worry about what am I going to do with all these fish. Now the common ones that I've always done in the past were white clouds, uh, rosy barbs, danios. Those are all, there's probably 500 plus species of fish easily that do pretty well for a lot of different people. We've got some, some cribenza species. We actually did that in the pond where the frogs were raising. We, we did some rare cribenzas for a while. And then we've got some pseudomogal rainbow. So a lot of the aquarium fish can go outside. And one of the good things is, like, you've never seen rainbow fish tell you vacationed them outside for three or four months. You bring them back into your show tank. They will look like the best rainbow fish anybody's ever seen. Getting that natural sunlight, eating all the bugs, getting all of the, uh, the pollens and everything going in there. So if you have a favorite fish, if it's got a, you know, range of temperatures, it can, it can tolerate, you'll see an even better version outside, especially when the sunlight hits, it looks amazing. A lot of metallic fish look really cool. Then you bring it inside and you get a whole new love of that fish. So I highly recommend it. So here's a, you know, a big sword tail that's being raised at Miami sword tails. A lot of footage there. This would be something fun. Maybe you go and you, you buy something on Aquabid or maybe you find uh, an online vendor or, you know, maybe I, I don't bring this up enough, but if you're a, a forum member on a forum, after 50 posts, you can actually trade and sell with other members. And so maybe there's someone locally, or not locally, well, could be local, but there's someone in the group in the United States or something like that, or other countries, if you find other people there, reading these, and they're selling some or trading some, and you could start your, your pawn this way. It'd be real fun, right? Then, you know, these are some pictures from uh, some farms in Florida. And I, what I want to show here is you can do a lot of things that don't make sense outside that don't work inside. We've got fancy goldfish and angelfish in this pond because it's big and there's green water, right? 
So things that you might be struggling with indoors, the minute you go, well, I struggle with it in a 29 gallon tank, it just becomes easier in that 100 gallon tank or that 200 gallon stock tank, right? With the green water and the sunlight and the bugs and all of that, it's just helpful. Here we've got, uh, I think we've got barbs and channel catfish, right? Here's another one, African cichlids. Got some live plants even, right? This is actually how they grow some of the some of the plants at uh, Florida Aquatic Nursery. So there's frogs and other stuff. And, and you might wonder, like, sometimes you get some contaminants in plants, or at least we do. And it's because they have nature come in too. It might be damselfly larvae, and we'll show you what that looks like. Because that's a common one that gets posted in uh, groups all the time. What is this alien-like creature that is in my water. Sometimes it just flies into your house, dragonfly, and they lay eggs or lay larva, right? You can get nice big pond lilies growing, which is nice. It's always nice to have beautiful flowers. This is actually from water hyacinth, a very easy plant to flower, and they grow like gangbusters. And so you look like, you know, you're an aquarium slash pond wizard to all your neighbors, your family, you can make it look really good. This is kind of a, a typical setup. You've got you know some water hyacinth here. You've you've bought some plants at a pond store. You've got a brick in there so you can put this kind of immersed plant growing. And you know Dean takes it to another level. And I like this level. I was always too lazy, but he surrounds his. This isn't Dean's tank, by the way, but he surrounds his with uh, like the bamboo, you know, if you had a bamboo screen or something like that, pretty cheap to buy, surround the pond, looks pretty good outside, by the way. At least have some fish, have some fun. Another lily, this is actually at uh, Florida Aquatic Nursery. All right, let's see here. Now let's talk about some of the elements, like hot versus cold. This is what my ponds would look like in the winter. And I'd be seeing what could overwinter. Now this wasn't the exact picture where I had two inches of ice, but it demonstrates this pond has white clouds and cherry shrimp in here. You can see my plants have died back. They're kind of under the, the slush. You know, it's pretty thick slush. The sponge filter started floating. Hey, I wonder why Corey made his sponge filters coarse foam and heavier. Was it because he was tired of this kind of crap where sponge filters would float in the winter and all these other hardships he's experienced over the last 20 years? Why, yes, yes it is. So sometimes I'll, I'll design a product to make a change, even though no one will ever experience it in their aquarium maybe, I know that this is the one I want when I play outside or something like that. So um, yes, uplift tube, normal kind of aqua toppy type sponge filter chilling outside. And then the airline tube, oh, it actually went up through a window and we were pumping warm air. Now, I learned in future seasons that if I laid a piece of glass or uh, greenhouse material like siding, right? The same thing, I made videos on how to make tops for your aquariums using the greenhouse siding. It would trap a lot of like heat in. Now, what does that mean? That means that it might raise the temp by another 10 degrees because the sunlight, you know, today it's not, you know, in this picture, it's not a very uh, bright sunny day because it was cloudy and snowing, right? But on the days it is, it raises that temperature up. These are just sitting above ground, right? And it's susceptible to swings. The wind blows, chills it, evaporative cooling, right? And so by putting something to block the wind, it keeps predators out. It makes it warmer. You create a solar heater by pumping in some air, maybe from inside, it can be even a little, little bit warmer. That's not, you would think 80 degree air into there would make a huge difference. It's like maybe half a degree. It's mostly the solar heating, right? Um, so the other thing you can do to help ward off temperature swings is bury your pond in the ground, partially, fully, any of those. How big of a difference is going to make will depend like in the winter here what is your frost line 
So like I think in uh, Pacific Northwest here, it's like 18 inches. It'll freeze solid the first 18 inches, and then it's basically 50 degrees underneath that. So if you go at least two feet down, that bottom six inches of the pond will be fairly warm. Now, there's a lot of things to learn about ponds and heating. One of the things here where the sponge filter is on the top, it's actually not necessarily a bad thing because it helps stratify the water. That's a big fancy term. What it means is the top water is going to be super cold, the middle water won't be as cold, and the bottom water will be the warmest because it's sitting against the earth. If I have a, a water pump or I have a sponge filter making the water mix all the layers, we end up with a big pond that's roughly all the same temperature. And that temperature is colder than the bottom would be, especially if you get that pond down in the ground and it's right at 50 degrees down there, you don't want to bring that 30 degree water down there and cool that down. So you can, you know, help yourself out by potentially turning off filtration. If it's a water pump or raising it, sometimes what I would do is I would use like a cinder block and maybe I had my plant sitting on there and then knowing when I'm done for the winter, I would move my sponge filter on top of that so that the bottom layer would still stay warmer. Now, you could use heaters. Heaters without a top, you're just throwing money down a well that you're never going to see again. If you put a top on it, that's going to help quite a bit. Back in the, the day, specifically this tank, this is where I learned in the Pacific Northwest, a 300 watt heater costs $20 a month to run 24 seven, because it's always on, because it's super cold. Now, the reason I was doing those calculations because I wanted to breed fish and become a billionaire. And so 20 bucks a month, I better make sure that in these colder months, these fish are growing and things are happening. And the reality I found was it wasn't really worth heating. You know, I had like six ponds here, 120 bucks a month. I wasn't really getting much growth. I couldn't really feed. And so I would bring the majority of them in or sell them. And then I would just keep finding more and more species that were cooler water temperature. And then I found covering them with uh, that sunlight panel really helped and extended my season. And there would be a few months where I didn't get um, you know, that good of growth or babies. But then you've got the opposite. You've got too hot, right? You live somewhere where it's now too hot. You got the opposite problem. More water helps, right? Recessing into the ground will help. Having a top would not help. That'll trap heat in. So you want them open, right? You want the evaporative cooling. You want that wind to blow and to cool that water down. Also, placement's very important. You know, maybe don't put it in direct sunlight. Maybe put it on the backside of a building. Put it in the shade. Put it under a tree. A lot, of, a lot of things are going to change. You put it on a tree, you get a lot, of, a lot of leaves, a lot of branches falling in. That can be good. Green water going. Provide shade. Got to clean a little more often, though, right? In Florida, what they do is they use shade cloth. So that, that idea of under a tree, that's what this is. It's all shade cloth because they don't want the water getting too hot, which you would think, does it really get that hot? Well, if it's 120 where you live or even 100 or even 90, it can get real hot. So if it's 90 degrees outside, but the sun's been beating down on that pond, it might be 100 degrees in there. You need a lot of oxygen. You've got, you know, you might have tried to go into it with cool water species thinking it won't get that hot, and they're dying because they're goodyids and they can't live that warm, right? Or you've got goldfish struggling. So in that instance, make sure you're choosing warmer water fish. And whenever you start, it's always an experiment. It's an experiment every time you go into it on this is a new house what are my predators like never had to deal with eagles before or osprey or i've got coyotes i don't think they're gonna you know but i've also got these weird you know lizards newts whatever they are i've got all these things that i like well i didn't have at the last house and so you don't even know what you're going to be up against yet but each time the elements will be different year to year will be different one year you get a lot of snow maybe one year you don't get a lot of snow when you get a real hot summer and dry maybe the next one's not right? All right, let's talk predators now. There's a lot of them. I'm only going to cover 
a few. This one is the one that is most often people are like, what is that? Dragonfly nymph, larva, right? I get a ton of them out in my pond because there's a billion beautiful dragonflies. But these guys will literally grab on your fish and eat them. And when they come into your house, they look like aliens because you're scooping all your fish up. You bring them in, you're like, what is this thing? Is it going to kill me and my family and all my fish? And the answer is, no, you just net it out and like go put it outside. Maybe put it back in the pond outside, let it try and hatch and do its thing. If it's towards the end of the year, though, they're probably not doing all that. Um, but yeah, you want to watch out for these guys. Scoop them out if you see them. But the only way to keep, really keep them out is you have to run it where you have glass or... Um, you guys hear that? There's someone mowing the lawn and stuff across the way. Hopefully. I, I have a bad habit of having people mow the lawn while I give presentations. But glass or the sunlight panel, kind of tighter fitting lids, that'll help you a ton in keeping out this invasive bug. But it also hurts you in that, what about all the bugs that my rainbow fish wanted to eat? Like, yep. So, you know, you, you get the good and the bad that you keep everything out, but you also keep out some of the nutrition. You keep it warmer, right? Like, it's going to be real hard to stop this guy if you're in a hot climate because you don't want to necessarily make it that hot. So maybe you just choose bigger fish, right? You, you'll adapt. And so if you're not running the glass or the greenhouse, I like to run this. This allows heat to escape. It allows bugs in. It allows me to see in very easily. Because when you put glass or anything on the top of there, a lot of times what you're going to see is a lot of condensation. So you don't really get to see your fish that well. It also lets me grow plants up and out of it if I want. That's good. Um, and these are, again, wire shelves that I buy at Home Depot or Lowe's. And I, I just cut them down to wherever length they need to be. And uh, they're easy to pull one off, put it the other side, or I've also put zip ties between them, so they work like a hinge. Done that too. And the trick here, you can see a little bit in this photo, the water level is about six inches down. Now, as obvious, we go, ooh, well, we want more water. More water, more better. You, If you fill it all the way to the top, that's, you know, you want it, that's six inches. That's just long enough that... That little raccoon arm getting in there can't reach your fish. Same with the, the cats and all the other predators. Still has frogs and newts and stuff in, and the bees can get in to get a drink, and nature can still do its thing. But you won't have any squirrels drowning. Unfortunately, I've had squirrels drown. That's not fun. I, I highly recommend that if you keep an open-top pond, by the way, you create a rock structure or something that when something falls in, it can crawl back out. Otherwise, you just have birds and squirrels drown. I've had both. You feel absolutely terrible. And then you instantly go, I need to make it so that if something falls in, it can crawl back out. Very important. If you were, you know, the goal here is to make new life, make new fish, make everything happy around you. And it's not, not happy when uh, you find something dead in there. So, uh, you could also block this down if you had to. You can you can see there's some holes in these these Rubbermaid totes that come. You could put padlocks and things, and that would allow you to um, keep kids out in theory. They could still drop their turkey sandwich through there, and and kids do that, right? Like it's not it's not terrible that kids do that. They're curious, just like we are, um, and they'll drop a rock in there and, and sand. That's actually one of the ways I start my my ponds. Is I'll go and grab a bunch of uh, grass that's, you know, from mowing the lawn and throw it in there. That'll get the cycle going, right? Also, these little dots, you can, you know, the little uh, drilled holes that come on some of the stock tanks. I've also used those to hook my air pump, like the linear, or not linear air piston pump, uh, the little USB nano pumps. They sit right in the sun. They just bake and they can burn out. If you get them some cover, they last longer. But I, I've had... I think when I set up like four of them, I had one of them last three or four years and still kept, still going. I had one burn out in like a month. I had two last like a season and a half, right? So they're not meant to be outdoor pumps, but I try to shade my pump. I try to keep them from not overheating, and those clips are handy sometimes. So, you know, I, I just bend the little clip that comes with it. 
look at there. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm sure someone's going to do this this year, and it'll be cool. Take one of our battery-powered uh, air pumps and hook it to a rechargeable, or I mean, it is rechargeable, but hook it to a solar panel. And because that it's got the, um, the battery in it, I'm thinking even if you're only getting sun like every other day, it'll keep that battery pretty full. And so you might have to run it on the power saver mode, but a lot of times you run into problems where, where you want to put your pond, you need a little bit of power probably for that air pump, and you don't necessarily want to run an extension cord. People are tripping on it, might not look good in your yard, a lot of things. So a lot of times what I'll do in those scenarios, if I only need that little bit of power, I'll actually run the pump in my garage or maybe on my porch or something, somewhere fairly protected from the elements. And then I'll like run uh, the airline tubing maybe around my plants because airline tubing is pretty cheap. You buy the, the you know the 300 foot roll or 500 foot roll, and you just weave it through the plants, and you eventually get it to your pond. And uh, you know you just gotta make sure you don't hit it with the weed whack, and you're good. So that way I don't have to worry about connections getting wet or you know running it over with a lawnmower or weed whacker, and it's live power. Um, so yeah. This is my niece, Roslyn, and uh, this, I always like to end this talk with, the goal for me is to get other people into the hobby when it comes to these ponds. So you get kids, you get everybody that's genuinely interested and attracted to the pond. One of the best benefits is if you put it kind of where you park your car when you get off work, you can feed it every day. But then also your significant other might walk by it every day or every time you take the kids or you go shopping, you just kind of go, oh, what's going on? And so you might have a whole fish room full of tanks, but maybe your significant other really never goes, uh, you know, goes out to see it. But if it's right by, you know, on the patio or the car, somewhere you spend time outside, you're going to see it all the time and they'll start feeding them and they want to ask questions about it. And then you'll have friends over for dinner and they're going to go, I think I saw a frog or I heard a frog or was that a new, I saw a fish. What is that? And that's the conversation starter of the pond. And I think it's really cool because it's a very cheap thing to do too. It's not be expensive. I think you can get into it easily under a hundred bucks. A lot of you could probably get into it for stuff you got sitting in the closet. Worst case scenario, you dig a hole, which is free and you throw a $3 tarp in there, it'll look bad, but it'll hold water. Even the right trash bag would, would technically get you through a season probably. So it doesn't have to be expensive. We tend to make it expensive. We tend to make it, uh, you know, a little complicated, but really it's nature. Let nature do its thing. I mean, we see frogs living in the drain, right? That any puddle, creatures will make use of. So, all right, now it's time for the Q&A. I'm going to close that because it's driving me nuts. The questions you have about ponds, we will, I'll see if I have a slide that makes sense. Otherwise, I will answer. What fish can winter in a small tub? White clouds, cherry shrimp. But if you've got, you know, a tub this big, it's going to freeze solid, right? So the more water you have, the less chance of freezing solid. Also, depending on your uh, climate. Oh, my plant. My big plants fell over. Oh, get back to the main, the main scene. Come on, Tiki. Hey. Typically do pretty well. Not the goodyids, but maybe uh, sword tails, platies, guppies, endlers. It's gonna be quite a few tetras you could do. Basically, things are known to be hardy. A lot of the barbs. Um, I would do cherry shrimp. Or anything other things I would do. Uh, there's some. I would do a pistagrama borelli. I would try some other stuff. I know some people have tried, uh, like bristlenose plecos and stuff. They didn't get a whole lot out of a whole season. They did make some uh, flagfish. I, I really like outside as well. You know, it, part of it is: Are you just trying to like enjoy it? Or do you want to make fish? But there's 
there's so many and uh you could start by keeping those fish in your house like right now i'm, I'm testing i'm running experiments all the time in my fish room i'm actually turning all the heaters off during the day uh so that at nine o'clock in the morning there's no more heat and the building will heat up from natural sunlight and then they come back on at 10 o'clock at night and so as I see which species handle this better and better, I'll know what ones are going to do better outside. If she just... Come on. I think she's done with that game. Huh? I think she's done with that game. Why? Right, come here. She's, she's not the show she dog really you want angry that you're making noise up here. Yeah. Okie doke. Tips on keeping possums and raccoons out of a patio tub pond. The only thing that I've found is you have to cover it. That's the only... Because even if I keep the water level low and they... So they want to be able to like touch the bottom or reach in. One of the two. And let me turn that down. And when I run sponge filters and things, i found that the raccoons will literally grab the sponge filter or airline tubing and just pull it out. And then they take bites and they go, oh, that doesn't taste very good. And they take another bite. And then they just throw that to the side and they start pulling plants out, taking bites and... Eventually they realize, hey, those aren't fish, they don't taste very good. But I find uh, the wire cover, you can make it out of, you know, uh, chicken wire. I really like those, uh, you know, I really like these because they're, they're coated in plastic. So it's unlikely to rust and they look okay. And uh, you can buy them in you know, four foot lengths, two foot lengths, a few different things. So you don't have to be, you don't have to have a ton of tools. And, you know, this is all from when I was like 21, right? And so I didn't have a bunch of tools and I lived in a duplex and apartment type living and that kind of stuff. So it's not like, well, let me go to the shop and let me grab my grinder like I would now. It was like, okay, I could buy a pair of tin snips or I could buy you know, something to get myself through these projects without having to buy big expensive tools I didn't have. And so that's in, and this, you could cut down the side here. You, you know, you could make it look better, uh, but once you get plants growing up through it, it's not so bad. And it, it's, it's like what we do with koi ponds. We put these big mesh nets and as long as it's big enough mesh, you see through it. Now I realized in this picture, you're going, this looks terrible, Corey. And I would be like, you're right. Uh, but in the right setting, you got bamboo around it. You kind of trim this down a bit. It doesn't look so bad back here. You can see, here's another little, this is like a 30 gallon pond. And you can see these are all pond plants that we would sell. So people could, you know, have their, their, uh, their little ponds. So what about using the de-icer in the winter? Yeah. De-icer is, is mostly, um, it's like a little styrofoam disc with some power. It kind of works like a uh, heater, basically, and and they work. But again, if you're not if you're not covering it, you're not going to keep it warmer. Those are meant to uh, basically keep a hole in the ice for gas exchange, but doesn't really do a whole lot else. Recommendations for floating palm plants that can handle full all day sun. Water hyacinth, water lettuce, frog bit, uh, azola, mm, duckweed, mm, salvinia, parrot's feather, hornwort, mm, probably some more even. But th that's just off the top of my head. Hmm. Yeah, cheap water lilies from Home Depot are a great choice. Yeah, you can, a lot of times you can get, I don't have any pictures because I am I haven't put them together, but like irises and stuff, you'll buy this plant for like seven bucks. Maybe it does nothing the first year because it's like been used and abused and moved around the world. But the coolest yellow and purple flowers and all of these things, it's really rewarding. And they, they overwinter, at least in my climate, they die back, but then they come back the next season. And it, it really is nice to see whether it's your garden or your pond making these beautiful flowers. And that's, that's what I think brings everybody in. The fact that you might be nerding out on the fish, 
you might have a different person nerding out on, oh my gosh, the birds are getting a drink, or oh man, look how pretty those flowers are, or oh wow, do you know you had a, a newt in there, or frogs. That's that's the magic of it, is that it's got something for everybody. And, uh, you know, even if I, I was a hardcore fish guy for a long time, breeding fish. I fell in love with the plant side of it, of like, but it's super fun because it's, it's kind of like you're used to shopping the fish stores, and all of a sudden, for a few months out of the year, you're like, wait, I can go to pond places. I... You know, oh, I got, I got to go pick up something new for the yard. And meanwhile, you're like, I better check out Home Depot's lilies. Are I getting new ones in yet? So it gives you an extra little thing. And it makes it, in my opinion, it makes aquarium keeping a year-round sport. Because typically during the summer, you're outside so much, you're not with the tanks as much. And so if you can bring some of those fish outside and put a little bit of that hobby. One thing I didn't explain well um, is that... When the water, let me let me get a picture back here because I, I want to make sure I explain this. When you get storms and water, rain, right, you'll get, uh, this can overflow. So normally what I would do is I would pick a point on there and I would drill a couple, two or three small holes uh, in like the rim. And so that way it always kept the water level lower so that, uh, you know, I didn't have the cat and the possum and the, the raccoon problem. What fish do better in hot climates? Any of the fish that, uh, you know, like hotter climates. Like you could try rams, you could try epistos, you could try cardinal tetras, you could try, you could try, you could try. A lot of this hobby is is a lot of trial and error. Someone's going, no, you can't do that. And then you'll realize like, oh, wait, you did that? I could do that too. I would experiment. That's the fun, that's the most fun part, especially if you breed it inside. Let's say you breed a group of rams inside your fish room or your house. Try a few of the fry outside. Maybe you breed them inside, you grow them outside. That's what farms do, right? That's, you, you, you can figure it all out and share with everybody. Reticulated history and loaches, yes. Here, here's how you know if a fish can live outside. Ready? Here's the trick. Is it a fish? Then the answer is yes. Now, can it live in your climate? Can it live under your care? I don't know. The same way as aquariums. Can this fish go in an aquarium? Yes. Can I keep it alive? I don't know. You better you better figure it out. Do you find that surrounding the tubs with bricks helps with insulation? I haven't noticed a, a, a good difference with that. It, it might keep it a little warmer, but it might also help it overheat. I never went through the, uh, the effort to do it much. So I was much more wanted and portable and uh, digging them down works for sure. I've tried that. But sealing in the heat, the easiest thing is that, that top layer. It, same thing in your home aquariums. Putting a glass lid on your tank is the like the most optimal thing you can do. But everyone's like, I don't like it. Huh. It's not, it's not, you know, there's, nothing, there's nothing sexy about it. It's just a glass top or a plastic top. It traps in that heat, lowers your power bill by probably 40% on that aquarium alone and uh, keeps fish from jumping, keeps things from getting in. Like it does so much, but it's not its not a cool new pump or cool new food or cool new gadget. It's just, just a glass top. That's what I would use. You're, you know, start there. All the bricks in the world ain't going to do anything if you don't cover the top. All right. Um... If you use plastic tubs and the sides buckle, do a few layers of duct tape around for support. It'll buckle, but it won't burst. Also, you could lower the water level, create less outward pressure. Uh, but in general, most, like, lower maids don't really flex much at all. I really like that. You can also, if you really wanted to, you can cut the, you know, ponds, you can cut the rim, and you can actually put hang on backs and stuff. But again, I like sponge filters, not power filters, because they just suck up all your fry. Even with sponge intakes, I know, but especially if you're doing any of the, the egg scatterers and stuff like that, they just, the fry are so small. And that's what I like doing outside, I like doing celestial pearl danios or any of those micro fish. The green water and all that really help uh, get you through those first, um, you know, those, those first stages. You also can do a pond outside, I've done it. Do I do it fairly often, actually 
is uh, raised brine shrimp outside. They're a live bearer when they're happy. So you just make salt water, you put it in a pond. I did it in one of these Rubbermaid ponds. And I just harvested brine shrimp out every few days for my tanks inside. And so if you have a hot climate, brine shrimp will do fine. You could also do a pond of Daphnia. Um, I had a, a customer and a friend, um, Dave Sanford actually, and he had horrible raccoons and problems and everything, but he had this gorgeous garden and they would always eat all his fish. And so he would just keep Daphne in his ponds because the raccoons and everything didn't care about Daphne. And he would scoop out Daphne and go feed all his beautiful fish inside. So if you can't beat the predators, put something they don't care about like Daphne, breed those, and then you can feed your fish. Now, what's funny is you can make more off Daphne a lot of times than you can fish uh, like at your local clubs. Everyone wants Daphnia. Everybody's fish loves Daphnia. Not everyone needs jewel cichlids or, you know, something you're breeding. But everybody wants, oh, if I can get Daphnia going. Myself included. I actually ordered Daphnia off of Aquabid and it arrived today. I put it in two tanks, one with green water, one without. And I'm going to see how I can do with them. What about observing and treating disease in ponds? Normally what I do is I quarantine fish inside, make sure they're healthy before I put them outside. So that's part of the get the tank going ahead of time, early, early, early in the season. Start figuring out what fish you want, get the fish in, quarantine them, make sure they're super healthy before you start moving them out. Now, it doesn't have to be an all or nothing thing. If you bought 10 of a fish that you want to breed, maybe you move three of them out and see how they do. You don't need to put 10 of them out and go, oh, they got eaten, or oh, they froze to death. You can move a couple and go, how are they doing? It's been a week later. Doing pretty good. Let's move some more out. Slow process. Slow and steady wins. And then when you bring everything in, I personally will uh, deworm them again. Basically, paracleanse. You could do more, but I find that because I cleaned up all these fish before they went outside, when I bring them back inside, likely about the only things that would happen, probably are going to be some parasites, maybe some bird poop and stuff. I've never even had a problem with it. But out of caution, when I, anytime something comes into my fish room, I want to clean it up. So the fact that it went outside, when it comes back in, that's an, you know, back to a controlled environment. I want to make sure they're clean. And then if I sell any to a local fish store or anything, I want to make sure they're clean going to them also. Um, so I find it very difficult to really observe disease and everything in a pond scenario where your water might be green and that kind of stuff. So I want to get them healthy and happy before they go out, have a good season, and then bring them back in. So it's kind of like, you know, think of it like spring training or something. You know, you want to make sure they're at their peak before they go to the actual season. And then when they come back out. I had a Daphnia culture last two years and fed and sold out of it. And then out of nowhere, it crashed. Not bad for my first try. Yeah. The, uh, it's crazy. I was reading, I was just reading like a little blurb that was included with these Daphnia and it had a link and Daphnia, uh, I think they only live like 10 days and they'll give birth like seven times in 10 days. And each time they give birth, it's like, two to eight more. And so a lot of times Daphne will crash because they just start breeding so fast. Like we get busy in life and we're like, oh, I had to work eight days in a row. Meanwhile, your Daphne culture is 73 times as dense as it was say eight days ago because you forgot to harvest every day. So it can be a little bit of a bear um, and they'll crash. But that's why I usually always run at least a couple things. And uh, like in the one picture here, I actually remember this now. Um, we'll go all the way back, all the way back. In this picture here, this was my main Daphne pond. And you can see here, I put all, so I grabbed grass clippings and I actually put it in here because I wanted the water to go green. And uh, that was so for the Daphnia. And then over here, I've got two 10 gallon tanks that just lay on the ground. Those also had Daphnia. So if I crashed my main culture, I could get some from one of these two. And that was my main goal. And these were my mo most of my breeders. And I actually had a big pond inside where I was doing a lot indoor year round, but I wanted to see if I could really expand that outdoor. 
my goal was to sell them at the store and uh the problem i ran into was they don't like chlorine and chemicals and this all had chlorine and chemicals and i didn't have very many fish tanks so i couldn't water change from the fish tanks in there you know so but now now i don't have chlorine maybe i can become a daphne farmer like i've always dreamed Uh, I keep a 55 gallon in my unheated detached garage this winter in Pennsylvania. Yeah, I, I've bred a lot of fish. So, like, once you start seeing how cold some fish can go, and then you go, well, it doesn't get as cold in my garage. I move a lot of stuff inside a garage. So it doesn't have to be in a fish room or in the house. But you start learning how you can manage big groups of fish and what temperatures they do. And then you know, like, Let's say you, you kept guppies out and you're like, well, it was cold. It was only 68 degrees out there. You know that, well, they don't have to be at 78 in my tanks in my house and it'll never get below 68 in my house. Maybe I don't need a heater. And that's where you see videos I'm doing where like, you might not need a heater for a lot of the sp fish species you keep. And it's just because fish are pretty adaptive. Okie dokie. Looking for some more questions. Which tanks need liners? Thinking of galvanized metal, random plastic, and whiskey barrels. Yeah, I would say wood whiskey barrels would need a liner. You can buy those usually at Lowe's and Home Depot and hardware stores. Random plastics, I just give them a rinse and they've always treated me well. And then galvanized metal, I've never had a galvanized metal pond. I always avoided them because people say you had to put a liner in them. Once I put a liner in them, they became more expensive than plastic ones. Uh, IBC totes, those big, white, ugly things that I used to have a bunch of and are great for raising fish. You kind of just want to make sure they didn't have crazy toxic tem chemicals, chemicals in them before you buy them so you can raise up your fish. Um, yeah. Basically inert. And, and the other thing is you can just try it, right? If you've got, you know, if you're breeding 5,000 guppies in your house, or right, 50 guppies, and you got a container outside, put two of them in there, see what they do, right? Do natural insect foods carry parasites that could harm fish? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Doesn't mean it couldn't, but not that I'm aware of. You also get other things, like you'll find natural kind of blood worms and, and other stuff that form in the muck in the bottom of your pond, all good things though. You'll even find like earthworms that get dropped in there by birds. Is it normal for koi to lose their scales? Not normal. Usually that's a sign that they're trying to evade predators or something else is going on. They get knocked off, but it's not normal. Best way to get a pond outside running on a solar, any way to get the co-op air pump for that pond, but run on solar? I think so. I haven't done it yet, though, but I, I think it'd be fairly easy with the technology today. There's so many, uh, like, USB recharging solar panels that I think it'd be fairly easy. I do. I, I used to, I did play with that way back in the day because I was going to try to design that product, but I couldn't get the price point down to where it made sense. Because all the little solar panels, they make, if you look on Amazon, they make air pumps that have like a built-in solar panel thing, but they're all so bad that I focused on just making a good battery-powered air pump, and then I think it'll be much easier just to recharge it. And uh, the other thing I didn't like was you need to have enough battery power so that if you get two or three days without any, um, you know, without any sun, you just don't run out of air. But the good news is you mostly need that. You need the air the most when it's hot and not as much when it's cool. So, you know, solar air kind of works that way because you, you get it when you need it. And when it's cool, you don't need it as much. Any particular tips? I'm doing a mud pond versus a tub pond. Wondering if running a heater in the winter will be as effective. It'll be the same effectiveness for the most part as long as you're covering it. The heat heat rises and escapes from the top, not nearly as much from the sides. So you're going to have well-insulated sides from all the mud, but it's just going to go straight up in the atmosphere without covering it. If you cover it, you'll probably see a pretty good difference by running a heater, if you need to. I can't stress that enough. So many people are like, they're, they're gearing up for like this really difficult scenario. And the reality is 
like the fish handle way more than we give them credit for. So, you know, I, I would definitely encourage you build that pond and build a great top for it and then see what the temperatures are when it's sunny. Like, so let's say you be built it today and you leave the top off and you're like, it's 50 degrees. Put the top on it and a week later with all those sunny days, you might be like, it's 74 degrees in there. It's really trapping the heat really well. And so you might be going, I can't run that during the summer, summer. It'll be way too hot. But when it gets back to winter, it's going to keep it at like, oh, it doesn't drop below 65 or something. And you might not need to supplement with additional heaters. So, you know, definitely you can, you can theory, we, we theory craft this a lot where you sit there going, it's cold out. I want to make sure I'm not going to lose everything. But also it's a very much learn as you go. If you haven't done it in your yard yet, you've got a lot to learn. Placement, how cold, how hot each season, what species, what foods, what predators. There's so much to learn. And that's what makes it really fun, though, is you go next year, you'll, you'll see that a lot. People that have been doing it, they go next year, this is my battle plan. And then they'll go, ooh, that worked out really well. That part, yeah, that wasn't so great. Next year, I'll bring the parts that worked well. And I'm going to try this thing. And then the year after that, I'm going to try this thing. And eventually you get something that you just like. You go, hey, this works really well in my setup. And that's what I keep doing now because it works well for me. Do you think that lining the bottom with shrimp hides would help small fish elude predators? In my experience, no. Uh, just because small fish and fry are just kind of derpy. And they're just like, oh, well, I'm going to go up to the top. And they're just like, oh, snacks. And I'm just eating them. And so I'm sure it, I'm sure in some way it helps a little bit, but all of the what I found worked best. I wanted to use a lot of live plants, and with all these live plants, the fish just feel safe. And then pretty soon, while feeling safe, they're just like, and I'm in a in the mouth of a raccoon. So I feel like you'd have to put all the protection down low, and then have no plants. So they because the fish are drawn to the cover. There's floating plants and, and other plants coming up out of the water. They feel like there's cover everywhere. They're just going to be swimming around. And so I, I recommend just covering it if you really run into that or lowering the water level. But I also, I guess I didn't stress this enough. I'm okay with wildlife eating my fish. So like, let's say I'm breeding white clouds. If I don't have any predators, I might end up with 1,400 white clouds at the end of the summer. If I do have predators, I might end up with 900 white clouds at the end of the summer. 900 still way more than I need. So short of, you know, that's, you know, when I was showing the things out in the wild where I'm showing all these predators and the fish living cohabitating, this is why fish go, you know, and Oscar goes, here's 5,000 eggs and I'm going to lay 5,000 eggs every week, knowing that a lot of them are going to get eaten. And that's, you know, so I would ask yourself, like, can you even, what are you going to do with these fish? You might, I, I find that I like to enjoy all of the nature and end up with a lot more fish than I started with. And even if I own a store, like 1,400 white clouds is a year's worth of white clouds. So you, if you only have 900, it's like, oh, I still have six plus months of white clouds I got to unload. Meanwhile, you got to feed them and keep them alive. And so I think the natural selection, not such a bad thing. Fun to watch. They get a good meal. Helps, you know, because eventually what happens also in your ponds, if you get the density up really high at the beginning, no babies make it anyway. If you go straight to 500 white clouds in the first month, you're not going to get another 500 white clouds in the second month. You're going to get like 100 because most are going to get eaten by their brothers and sisters. So I'm not, I don't need to keep all predators out. I just need to make sure they don't eat all my fish. They can eat half for some or whatever. Egg crate and light diffuser could be good for pond for cover, or cover for pond. Uh, I find it's not a good cover in my experience. The plastic gets broken down by the UV from the sun and it bows really bad when stepped on by a predator. So it can crack and in my experience, didn't work so well. So the things that I do highlight like the, the greenhouse siding and the, the wire mesh. It's because they work where like, and the windows and things like that. What, you know, there's like, there's another 400 materials that don't work. Like why do you, why do you recommend saran wrap Corey? It's cheap because predators get through it really easy. 
That's why. There's a lot of things where it's like, oh, all right. So I'm only imparting the things that I know I've found to work. You'll find lots of things that don't work, just like I have. And you go, okay, well, I guess that's why he's recommending this thing that costs money. Because I've tried all the things that were just free before. And then it's like, okay, back to the drawing board. Okay, well, okay, that didn't work either. And so, you know, you find, like, one time I made a, a top out of uh, the greenhouse panel. It's great. But I didn't quite get the right seal. So then I used, like, the... Uh, I used pipe insulation, which is basically like those pool noodles. I went all the way around it. Fit perfect. You know what it also did? It attracted every cat in the neighborhood going, ooh, I love scratching the crap out of this pool noodle. It's so satisfying. It's like you built a cat scratcher. So you learn. You learn from everything going, oh, okay. Well, that, I'm not doing that again. Now I got to think of a new material to make up the difference. So there's, there's always... You know, we've got our own little human brains going. We've got it all figured out. And then you're like, oh, well, who knew that by putting this thing, it's actually like ants love it. Like, oh, okay, well, that's a new problem. Or, oh, I've got a wasp nest being built in this thing. Like, okay. There's always some Nature is going to throw you for a loop every time. So I've yet to ever meet someone who's really doing a lot of ponds and they've got it all figured out. They're going, oh, yeah, sometimes this happens. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes that happens. Aluminum foil? I feel like aluminum foil would just, like, you just push on and go right through it. So I, I would not recommend, you know what I would recommend? Glass tops, greenhouse siding, the wire shelving. We can play that game all day. What about paper? What about an old pizza box? What about an Amazon cardboard box? What about styrofoam? Yes, styrofoam actually does work, but it blocks all your light. But one of the things you can do in a pinch in a koi pond or something like that is take like a, a styrofoam box that Fisher shipped in and take the lid and you float it. That provides a little bit of cover still. The only good news is predators don't get on it because it's so wobbly, but it looks terrible and uh, it doesn't help really insulate. It. Well, it does do one thing. I tried it. It'll keep a little bit of air barrier so it won't completely freeze over for like another few degrees, but it's still not perfect. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> yeah, it was a joke. I, I don't take anything as jokes anymore because I was going to say, I assume you're joking, Julian, but... Like 60% of the time, when I think someone's joking, they email customer service and they'll say, like, I was actually very hurt. I was new to the hobby, and Corey made me feel bad. And so I've learned to just force myself, take it like it's serious every time, because then you can come in and tell me it's a joke, and I'm not hurting the feelings of people that were just uneducated and didn't realize, like, that was going to be something that seemed like a joke. So I really, you know, I just try to always take it as normal to alienate the least amount of people because that's my job. All right. And, and yes, foil is a legitimate question because some people are going to go, well, what about the reflective properties? What about trapping and heat? Like the weird part about everything is if you think about it long enough, you're like, well, actually I could see why that might be applicable. So I just found it easier, treat it like no one's making a joke until they tell you who they are. I'd much rather be the one going, oh man, I'm the fool, than having people, you know, like I've ruined, you know, it's just happened too much where it's like, oh geez, I did. had I known it was gonna, you know, get us negative reviews and all of that, I wouldn't have made the joke, so. Bluetooth thermometer, yeah, that is something I haven't really dabbled in too much, um, but technology keeps, getting cooler and cooler. So I actually have like about a weather station. So I could be my own little weatherman. But they do make an accessory where you could, um, you know, like Bluetooth. It's, it's, they basically make it for like your your pool and stuff, which I don't have a pool, so, but I could do a pond. So that'd be kind of cool. I also, you might want to get like a little, you know, maybe game camera or just like a cheap Casa camera pointed at your pond. So that way when you, you know, like, oh, man, something pour into my pond, you can go, oh, it is the neighbor kids, or oh, it is raccoons, or it is, 
you know, a giraffe. Mm. I remember we talked about another random stream. If you keep a sponge filter upon overwinter, the beneficial bacteria isn't affected by the cold temps. Uh, I'm sure it is affected, but I believe it just goes dormant. So while affected, not detriment detrimentally affected. By the way, join our Facebook group if you haven't. We talk about a lot of stuff. That's actually where I got the idea to do this topic today. Was people are talking about starting to get their summer ponds going. And I got, hey, I got a presentation. I have a meeting to bring some of these presentations to the live stream. Let me see if I can get that working today. One of the benefits of doing it on Wednesday, it's in the middle of the work week. I have time to work on stuff. Or Sunday, it's like wake up, eat breakfast, live stream. We're being at 4 p.m. I worked out today, then I did some work, and then I was like, all right, I got like an hour. I think I might be able to pull this off. Let me see if I can get, you know, PowerPoint injected into the software, working at a reasonable way that I could give a presentation. Sneaky giraffes, that's right. I will say though, the amount of different things you don't even know live around your house yet is very high. And once you put that pond in, you're like, wow, who knew we had all of these birds, all of these reptiles, all of these bugs, all of you just everything comes out of the woodworks. So it's just super cool. I honestly, I enjoy all of the things that aren't the fish more than the fish during these ponds. But there's no reason for me to not have some fish. So I do put some fish in there. But honestly, it's really, really fun to just see, you know, your own little zoo kingdom from nature. Even if you're like, you can set these up on a balcony in an apartment. And pretty soon you're like, check it out. I got the little chickadee birds and oh, the hummingbirds. And oh, man, look at this. Wow, look, the you know, the dragonflies are mating. You get just all this stuff. Even though you're on the eighth floor, you'd never get any of this stuff. And now you got it. Do I have any experience with mud ponds? Uh, not so much. I mean, I've visited ponds where they're like breeding koi and stuff. But I myself, I, well, I, I guess I have a mud pond. But I haven't done any dredging or anything. And I didn't build that one. So I, I'm an observer and not a builder of it. Which I feel like you learn a lot about when you build it. And then you break it. And then you build it. And then you break it. I suggest using native fish. This seems like a fast track to an invasive species problem. I would argue that using native fish is worse. So like in my state, you actually have to pull a permit if you're going to use a native fish. So imagine I go and I find native fish eight hours away and I bring them to my yard and my pond overflows into a creek and now they're in the wrong waterway. If I was doing that with a pistogramma cockatoides, and it floods and it gets out and it goes into the waterway, guess what? It freezes to death. So there are definitely some arguments of native fish are would be easier to keep in your climate, but that is the argument on why you probably shouldn't be because it's very easy to get the wrong things in the wrong waterway. At least when we do that, if that freak accident happens from our aquarium fish, they're highly likely to die in a lot of our climates. Now, there are definitely places where it's warm enough and, and that's not always applicable, but for a lot of these states, it's actually better to have a tropical fish get out if it's gonna and die off when it gets cold than to have a native fish get out into the wrong water and then make it. So, um, you know, use use some caution. And, and like the reason I, I don't do native fish is, like let's say I've got my, my pond and I wanna do a native fish. I have to have a site survey. They have to figure out, okay, could it get into this waterway? Could this happen? Could this happen? It actually costs a lot of money and a lot of time and energy to, to pull something like that off, where if I just have a little pond and I put cherry barbs in it, I'm good to go. But I would say do some reasonable uh, preventative measures, right? Like don't put your pond two feet from a wild creek or anything like that. Like be the steward of nature that you're enjoying. So because people, you know, the world itself is taking care of nature, we get to enjoy it today, take reasonable actions to not ruin it, right? Now, it happens all the time. 
things get out all the time. And you'd be like, you can be as safe as you want, and then your entire house gets flooded to the roof and you owned aquariums, guess what? They got into the wild. But don't, you know, don't set it up where it's like intentionally going to happen. That's not smart. Okie dokie. We already have every non-native fish in our waterways. Yeah, if you're in warm water, there's a lot. I've built and broken my car so much that I know what all the sounds are. Probably because I, I'm the cause. Well, there that happens a lot in, in consumer products, right? If you own, let's say, a 2012 Toyota Camry, and you've done all the repairs on it, it actually makes a lot of sense if you go to get a new car someday to get another 2012 Toyota Camry because you already know how to fix it all and all that kind of stuff. So that's where you end up, you see a lot of times like, I'm a Ford guy, I'm a Chevy guy, I'm a blah, blah, blah guy because they know how to work on them and, and it's easier instead of like having to relearn it each time. And uh, yeah, but the learning process is important for all hobbies. Agreed, there's so much paperwork with the DNR to keep native species from Minnesota. Tropicals definitely not surviving for long in the wild. I think in Minnesota, aren't, uh, I think, koi are illegal? I think that's a true thing. Because they could survive, potentially. Like, I know we can't do, we can't keep natives in Washington. It's just illegal straight up without permitting. But even then, it's pretty difficult. Some species just can't. And then... Um, we have all crayfish are banned. And then some other fish too, but mostly it's all crayfish. So I can't do any crayfish inside or outside anyway. I'm going to pop off. It's getting some stuff done. It's getting late, but I'll rewatch the entire stream this weekend. Good. Yes, yeah, so if you, you know, you might have to listen to the replay because we change it to Wednesday afternoon slash nights, depending on where you live or from some other person, it was going to be midnight. Well, that happens. What are you going to do? All right. My screen. There we go. My chat over here stopped moving. So I got I to gotta look over here and it'll look like I'm not paying attention, but I am. Uh, oh, another thing I've done a few years outside is I vacation my turtles outside. Um... So they get a lot of natural UV and that kind of stuff. And I just spend more time if I'm barbecuing and stuff outside. It's fun to watch the turtles enjoy it too. <coughs> do I ever think about shipping fish? I think about it all the time about how I'm never going to do it. I think about a lot of, uh, a lot of other businesses do it. And I don't know how they're making much money and how they keep people happy. It's a rough gig. An 01 Camry with 70,000 miles, I guarantee my wife is jealous. She drove her 01 Camry until it was over 200,000 miles, and I basically forced her to get a newer car with newer technology because it was becoming quite expensive to fix, and everything was just wearing out because it was over 200,000 miles. But, yeah, if I find one with, like, low miles, I'd buy it for it. She would love it. Going to use my 17-gallon muck bucket to breed cherry shrimp. Can you suggest submerged aquarium plants that do well in cold water? Pretty much all of them. I don't think I've found too many that in the aquarium hobby that don't thrive. <coughs> that mean, well, okay, let me take that back. Most of them will die off if you're going to keep them out there when it freezes. But in terms of outdoor during the warm time, it should be fine. You can plant milkweed and planters near the pond to lure in monarchs. That sounds fun. Yeah, butterflies are super cool. I, hadn't, I, I haven't taken it to that level. I've always been a renter when I was really doing a lot of ponds. And then, and then I was super busy with the, the business. And the business is super busy now. But I'm, I'm just getting to a point where maybe I can focus a little more on like the yard and, and that kind of stuff. So, yeah. <coughs> How do I keep my turtles from escaping? 
Are you ready for it? Glass tops, greenhouse panels, or wire <laughs> wire shelves. Same thing for all of them. It just whether you're trying to keep stuff from getting in or keep stuff from getting out, keeping the water level low, obviously. You know, I'm sure my wife's got some pictures somewhere of, of our turtles like basking in the sun and um, but for the most part, making sure that uh, turtles are pretty strong, making sure they can't get their claws onto the rim and pull themselves up. So you keep the water level lower. Uh, for those ones, I was using uh, the 360 gallon Laguna tubs. Uh, let's see. I live in southern Alaska. Give me your ideal setup for cold water outdoor pond, two to three fish, and plants. Mm, I don't know how cold it gets in southern Alaska. Everyone always wants me to do this for them. Like, pretend you live somewhere you've never lived. What is the perfect thing there? I'm like, I don't know. I personally would start with cherry shrimp and white clouds. And then if you come back to me next year, you're like, they all die. All right, well, uh, we'll try something else. Or if you're like, they all did well. I want to try something new. Then we'll go, we'll try something else. All right. I just don't know how cold. I mean, you can do things to improve your chances. Dig it into the ground. Keep it in your garage. Run a heater. Run some glass tops. You know, but it sounds like you want a smaller pond because there's two to three fish and some plants. I would say, ah, just try something cheap. One thing I love about white clouds is you can go buy them as feeder fish. And you're like, oh, I bought them six for a dollar. And then you just see how it goes for the summer. Kind of easy. <laughs> ETA and the accordion cough invisible lid. Never. They're too bulky to ship. We're never inventing that. It has to be, uh, it has to, has to be a teleporting invisible lid. That's the only way it's going to happen. Any design idea on a co-op canister filter? Oh, yes. All the designs. Think of the coolest thing a canister filter can do, and then I'll be like, yes, I think so too. But I won't share any of it because I don't want competitors to steal it, and I have no idea if I'll ever launch one. But I got ideas for days, both good and bad. Things that I think are amazing, some people think are terrible. So, yeah. Hmm. If partially wet soil on and off in soil next to the pond, swamp milkweed. All right. Look around at nature. Do you see the little minnows early in the spring? What species are they? Then go from there. Yeah, I mean, in general, minnows, they're just kind of hardy fish that have taken a beating in most climates in the world. And, uh... I actually went to where white clouds are in China, but they're extinct. So I went there and I was like, hey, here's where white clouds used to be. All right, moving on. I've, learned, I've been in the hobby for 50 years and it seems I learned something new about fish keeping almost daily. Yeah. Well, just think about it. I mean, there's people that spend their whole lives studying like one species of fish. And here we are learning about Everything that looks remotely cool to us. There's no way we can know it all. Like there's so much to learn that it's a never ending. You don't really get to to be like, I I, I learned it all. Does, no one knows it all. No one even knows how much we need to like imagine it was like how many facts are fish? Like, I don't know, 40 billion. And then you'd still be like, oh, that was only half. Who knew? Tadpoles can be fun in the ponds? Definitely. I've, I've had tadpoles a few times. Super fun. I love... I So, I love to put fish and other stuff in the pond. I love it more when something else moves in. Because it's like, I didn't even plan for this. Like, I don't know what type of frog it is. I don't know what it's going to do. What do you think it's going to eat? Like, and then I get to watch nature unfold. And I go, oh, sweet. It's making sounds. Doing things. It runs away when I come up to it. If I was a fish, what would I hope to be? This this goes back to a live old, or a long, my brain is falling apart. An old live stream from long ago, 
I would be a Corey, as in myself, sized pygmy corridor. Did the first run of multi-test strips not have an expiration date? I have an original, and it's missing a date. New bottle had one. Wondering how long they're good for after the date. Many years. It, it really only depends on the humidity that gets in the bottle. But we're actually looking into the legality if we even have to put an expiration on there. Because the random amount of time is irrelevant. It's actually humidity. So a sealed bottle that never gets opened last a really really long time opening it up 40 times a day for fun they're not gonna last nearly as long i put a lot of humidity in there i live in alaska and i've been wanting to try an outdoor pond what do you recommend that can handle colder weather down to 40 degrees white clouds and cherry shrimp start there that is just start there if you're wildly successful try something a little harder if it goes horribly wrong Try again. That's where I'd start. It sounds non-glamorous, but it's easy. It's cheap. They look really good. They're easy to breed. It's got everything you want in that pond. You just don't know it yet. Trust me. Put your faith in Corey of Aquarium Co-op going, he says this is going to be cool. I don't know if I've ever met someone that's actually set it up and be like, I did not have fun. They go... Oh, I want to try again, but I want to try it with these. And they, those look really good. And I gave them to my pet store when I was done. And then I did this, and then I did that. Because so I've certainly met a lot of people that are like, I'm going to do this exotic fish. And they buy them, they spend a bunch of money, and a week and a half later, like, I fed my possums. And then they build a, a top for it, and they buy more, and then they're like, oh, and then they got too hot and died. And then they change their setup, and they buy more, and then they, oh, it was the season was over. So... Start with setting it up and getting some success under your belt. You, if you've never built a pond before, if you don't know the predators you have, if you don't, if you didn't think like, oh yeah, it's going to bake in the sun or get too cold or this, take the the challenges out. White clouds easy, cherry shrimp easy. Take those and then focus on all the things you don't know yet. You might, you could probably keep those alive inside really easy. So make it really easy outside. And then add in all the difficulty factors of like, well, I didn't know I was going to be lots of you know, lightning snow. All right. Java moss. Java moss works great for my ponds. Yes, definitely. You make a lot of Java moss. What about using polycarbonate sheeting for the top? That is greenhouse siding. Yep. I recommend it. Are you saying white clouds and cherry shrimp with a glass top might work? You know, Stephen, it might. It just might work. If you're crazy enough to try it, that might work. <laughs> you guys are getting a little dose of what it's like to work at uh, like a fish store or answer comments on any platform. It's what's happening here in the live stream, except it's just every minute of every day of your life. At least on here... People should have been listening, but when you answer a comment, like let's say I do it in the DMs of, of Instagram, it's literally, I could post a picture of a pond and then you'll get 900 DMs and each DM goes, I live in this state. What fish, plants, and pond would you recommend for this state? And just repeat that 900 times. That's why we don't do any of that one-on-one -on -one stuff anymore. Because at least in a group, you can go, Okay, we, we kind of figured out what's going on with hot places. We kind of figured out what's going on on neutral places. We kind of figured out what's going on with cold places. And now we've handled 900 in 12 minutes as opposed to six days of hand cramps texting. But I get it. Everyone, you know, we're in, we're in this hobby because we all have curious minds. We go, what about, what would work? And we also know that we're playing with the lives of animals. So when we get it wrong, things had to die. It's not fun. We all want to prevent that. And so some of us are more comfortable than others, and some want to run every idea by somebody. We want to get confirmation. But even with the confirmation, it can still go wrong. It happens all the time. Even for me, I ask someone, like, you bred this, right? This should work? Didn't work. I killed him. Oh, okay. Well, let's figure out where we went wrong. we got to learn. 
We need Corey GPT to ask the same questions over and over. Let me see. So, by the way, Irene, if you're listening, I hope you're feeling better. Irene posted uh, she had an emergency where her, I think her appendix tried to explode and, uh, you know, take all of her fish with it. But she's out now, and I think she's back home and doing well. And uh, But part of what she's been working on, a lot of our team been working on this. Let me see if I can. Oh, that's. I got ten minutes left. Okay. Uh, let's see. There it is. Let's see if we're how far we're getting. So kind of along the lines of Chat GPT, which if you don't know what that is, it's kind of like the ultimate Google. Right? We're building our own thing, and we've been waiting to re- release it because. We're afraid that you're going to go there and you're going to go, hmm, boring. Saw the end of it. It's dumb. So, no, this is very early stages, right? And we're, we're actively paying employees to work on this every week. So, it's it's getting better. And I noticed, like, in theory, if these are done, we've got, like, we've added 47 fish care guides. I'm going to share it. Can I share my screen? Will this blow? I don't know. It's going to blow up in my face. Let's see. No, that's not going to work. I've lied. Wait. Maybe. Maybe I can show you guys. Give me one second. This might happen. This might happen today. Let's see. Can I change the source? Change the source to this one. All right. We're doing it. We're doing it live. So we've made a help center. I'm going to post this link in the chat, which, Mm. well, you're going to, you're going to see some chat inception here. There we go. So I've now posted that link. And we're building out, so like, maybe you want to learn about aquarium filtration. This is this help center. You can just type stuff in. Like, what if I type in puffer? You can see we have articles and answers and everything in this database. We're basically building a library to work for pea puffers, dragon puffers, arrowhead puffers, and green spotted puffers so far. Right? But what if you want to learn about filtration? How to use pre-filter sponges? How much filtration does your query need? How to optimize filtration? What's in the category? So once you click into filtration, you can go, okay, we can start learning about it. how to optimize an aquarium filter. You can read a little synopsis. You can see the different videos we've done. Because a lot of times where this started was people said, I remember reading or seeing or hearing you guys said this thing about a thing. I can't find it anymore. Could you provide that for me? And that comes into customer service all the time. We see it in the groups all the time. And so we're creating this resource that should be very easy to search for all the things. So we're bringing in the thousand videos we've done. We're bringing in the hundreds of blog articles we've done. We're bringing in presentations and all these things to one central place, the help center, where you can come and you can learn and be self-driven in your learning. And so maybe like right now we've done 47 fish care guides so far. All right, let's click on one, uh, dwarf gouramis. So we've got a video right here. We've got other resources. You can uh, read about them. You can, you know, buy them even, right? Cardinal Tetras, here's a video I've done. Here's a, an article we've done. And so hopefully, As we keep building this out, we're putting a fair amount of resources into it every week to keep building it out. Uh, What one did I do? I was playing with it. I did did the aquarium plant care one. And so you've got all these topics like, hey, I want to learn about lighting for my aquarium plants. Here's the video I've done, right? Here's how to control algae with light and balance. What's PAR mean, right? And then we've got all of the guides. So we're, we're putting together resources to start telling the story of you're interested in a topic. How can you basically work almost like a textbook or something? Hey, I want to go through the chapters and learn each thing. And uh, But maybe you're going, I know all about life. Well, how do you grow plants? Okay, well, we've got a video on that. Okay, well, what about plants are easy for beginners? We've got that too, right? And so imagine if we do one of these for Ponds outside, and I've covered all these topics in various videos and blog articles. Because I bet you we have outdoor ponds. Like this is in the healthcare yet, because we haven't got to that section. But we have done how to make mini outdoor ponds, and we have how to care for hornwort in aquariums and ponds. Puppy 
little things, right? We can keep building on all of this. And hopefully our, our biggest goal here is that we put in all the work, you guys will be able to share these things and tell people, go look that up at the Aquarium Co-op Help Center. Now, the only way to find it right now is you got to go to Aquarium Co-op slash pages slash help dash center. I'm going to probably sometime tonight get that on the top navigation up here so you guys can easily find it. But we've been working on this for like over a month. You know, here's a whole section on breeding fish for profit, different species. You've got the whole uh, the whole series. This gets lost on YouTube. People forget that like, wait, here's part one, part two, part three, part four, part five, part six, part seven. Right. This video just came out. And so if you watch all that, that's going to be like three or four hours on how to breed fish for profit and turn it into a business. We've had people do that. And then your next question is going to be like, well, what about what are some of the fish and the setups I can start doing? These are all things that we, uh, you know, have covered. So it's not only for profit, but, um, you know, some of them I've done for profit. And some are just like, hey, how do you breed a pistogramas? Hey, here's Dean showing us how to breed a pistogramas. So as we build this network, we want to keep filling in as many holes as possible. So, you know, I have a question. Let me consult the help center first. Or you have a question. Have you looked at the help center first? And so it's our goal to add basically categories and flesh them out every week. So I, I get it. You're going, there's five. That doesn't cover the hobby. I totally get that. But hopefully when there is 50, it's going to be quite the resource. Even here, like we, we include a little bit like the membership stuff because we get a lot of questions. I can't find the member only live streams, right? Then you go, okay, well, here's the upcoming ones. You click on this. Guess what? Here's all the upcoming talks. Which, by the way, we just landed Dr. Tim Miller Morgan, super knowledgeable guy. I've taken classes, uh, and he's the one that taught me how to put fish to sleep and do gill scrapings and all that kind of stuff at the zoo, right? We've got another talk by Dr. Jack Craig about South American knife fish. We've got another one, Dr. Er, PhD Anthony Maserol, invasive species in the Peruvian Amazon, right? Those are coming up. But you can learn about, uh, you know, Ask Club presentations, right? This is all the talks that you guys get for five bucks. We had this one from Mike just uh, four days ago, but there's quite a few professionals that we have hired. Like, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. 2021. 20, That's a lot. We've been doing it for 21 months, right? So you can come in here and you can get some ideas. Maybe you learn about terrariums a little bit for your outdoor pond plants. Maybe when you remember I said Carl Trochu and his outdoor fish room, you might go, oh, but here's a whole talk. If I listen to the fish that he's breeding outside, maybe that's ideas for my ponds outside, right? So all of our stuff works together just like our products work together and this and that. And we're just trying to bring it all back to a center hub. When does the help center go live? I mean, technically you can use it right now. We just don't have it. Like we're, we're not doing like, this is like the preview. You guys are like in the, the beta stage. Like before we really promote it on Facebook and, and, you know, really try to bring people to it. We want to make sure that people are liking it and we've got enough content because you know, I've done it in the past and I'll probably do it again. Like there's way too much, like I'm going to do a thing. The thing is great. And what I, you know, I, I make good on my stuff. So it might take me years. So I'm trying to hold this one back a bit and just go, Hey, it's going to be good. We're working on it, but we had, we were supposed to, we we're actually going to show this two weeks ago or yeah, two weeks ago. And I said, ah, we got to build a little more. And then Irene got sick and that delayed a little bit. Hey, not Fulton. It's just, that happens. You got a team of people. We got to go on vacation. We got to get sick. We got to stuff. Got to be your birthday. Got to be all kinds of stuff. Right. And so, yeah, it, I just saw it six o'clock. And in fact, I have a dinner to go to with Randy is in town, the VP and Robert. You guys know Robert from the unboxings. So I'm going out to dinner with those guys, which I don't do very often, but uh, yeah. So 
when I get back from all that, I'll try to get this help center actually up and easily findable. But, uh, you know, just know it's a resource we're building. Yes, it'll make us money in the long term. But in the short term, I'm hoping it's going to help. People. That's the main goal is how do we, we've, we've done so much. A thousand videos. I, I guarantee there's a hundred videos that you want to watch that you don't even know exist yet. We got to find ways because like all these care guides, they all have a video associated with them. Same with the plant care. All of them have videos. So we're just trying to find a good way to categorize that and the blog articles. And, you know, like we have lighting guides, we have algae guides, we have water change guides, all these resources we've built over the years. And they just don't really have a good home. So now they're going to have a home. That's the goal. So, all right. Don't forget, enjoy nature daily. Set yourself up a pond. Make sure you compliment somebody else with their aquarium hobby. You know, come full circle. Someone will appreciate what you're doing. It'll be good. It'll make you feel better. It'll make that person feel good. And we'll see you on Friday. Friday, we got a video. I think it's the one Dean and I are cutting glass and uh, installing some auto feeders and, and doing some stuff. And those are coming out on Fridays now, so not on Saturday. We won't have a live stream this Sunday because we do them on Wednesdays now. So I can spend more time with grandma, hit a farmer's market, do that kind of stuff. Maybe even go outside and enjoy nature. And I'll make sure I dial in this microphone by next time because that was embarrassing. That it's not great. So I'll see you guys soon. Have fun. Eat something good. We're going to have Mexican food. Tacos could be consumed. It's true. So. Thanks, everybody. Buy all of our stuff, by the way. I forget. Buy it, buy it, buy it. That way, we make $40 billion. We take over the world, solve world hunger. Or maybe just buy a lot. We all keep our job, and we make another video so you can consume it next week, and then we'll do something else and hopefully have a good time. That's more likely. So, bye-bye. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time.